Okay, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We are continuing with the National Child Care Association's Webinar Wednesday, which is the first Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for members and prospective members. We are so grateful to have Ms. Regina Miller with us again because we recorded this last week. We thought we recorded this last week, and unfortunately, we only got nine seconds. And Regina, I just have to say, it was such a pleasure to watch you work with um, Joy and to help us understand what Joy means, which is your presentation today. But I have to let everyone know that we had to set up a time to do this over to videotape it again because so many people were engaged and interacting with you and writing comments that we'll go over at the end. But you are definitely a gifted, beautiful soul, and we're so honored to have you here today. And we're recording for the second time, and we're going to make it work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here again with you. Uh, for 40 years, for over 40 years, I have laughed, I've cried, and I have grew in this field. I came to this field with joy, and today I'm going to talk to you about don't let anyone steal your joy. Let's talk about what joy is. I'll take the next slide, Diane. Yes, ma'am. Just give it a second. No problem. So joy, I want to tell you what joy is. Joy is an emotion. It's evoked by a well-being or the joy that you feel because of the prospect of something that's going to happen. So a lot of us, especially in the early childhood education field, we come into this field, we're excited like the ladies on the right. We're just, we can't wait to teach. We can't wait to grow. We can't wait to be a director. And then real life sets in. So I wanna to talk to you about how to keep that joy. Before you can give anyone, anyone, including your family, anything of you, you have to have it inside of you. So don't try to pour from an empty cup. Remember that you won't be happy every day, but you can feel joy every day. You, um, I wanna talk, I'm kind of going back over my notes a little bit here, so bear with me, please. I wanna talk statistics. Um, you, you have to know that our, our field has weathered what we call an, um, a very bad time, but we're essential workers. And so therefore we've shown the world why they need us. Let's not back down now. I want you to know that statistically the job market for early childhood educators is very good. According to Zip Recruiter in 2020, our average teacher just John in our field was making, with, with a degree of course, was making $28,967. This, of course, varied by the city and the experience of that applicant. The job market outlook is extremely good. The latest stat for us shows that we grew by 4.7% since 2019. I don't know about you, but that makes me extremely happy because we're going to age out and we need more happy people in our field. You have to advocate for great teachers. You have to for change for our field. Remember that it's you that, are, that is the voice of our, our industry. So we must bond together. Just like any other profession, we have to make sure that our local and federal government understand our needs. Next slide, please. So I kind of got ahead of myself on the slides, but I wanted you to just kind of take a look at the pictures that I put there. Because to, statistically, our average pay and being an advocate is what will make this feel more attractive to the young people. I happen to sit on an advisory board at the Friends University College here in Wichita. We have so many students joining early education that it makes my heart happy. There's still a need for people to want to go into our field. They're not gonna wanna go in our field if we do things that make us look like we're unhappy. Now, again, we won't be happy every day, but the most important thing is that you don't let your joy go away. I'm ready for the next slide. When you're hiring the right candidate, 
Remember that that candidate doesn't know you. It may be someone fresh out of college or fresh into a program learning how to, to teach children. They're, they're coming to you because they've seen something in your facility that they want to work there. Remember that you have to be the strength of your team. You have to lead by example. Now, granted, every day, again, it's not going to be a great day, but the joy should be there every day. When you're hiring your right candidate, remember this. The candidate is not going to want to come to a team where they do not see opportunity. So remember to hire a lot of diversity. Remember growth for everyone. And remember that your interview sets the tone for your culture. So remembering your interview process to also let that person know what they can achieve by working with your, your company and where they can grow. No one wants a job with a dead end. So remember that, that our new employees deserve the same treatment that someone gave you. It's called paying it forward. I want to leave you with three good takeaways as well, but I'll wait for the next slide. Our parents, our parents expect professionalism from us. The parents look at us as if you would any other professional. When you need a doctor, you go to a doctor and you expect that doctor to be able to answer your question. It's the same in early childhood education. When they ask you a question about their child's temperament, kind of development, about a, a program that fits their child, you should be able to answer all of those questions. I've done many parent surveys over my 40 years in this industry. And I've heard over and over again, and it um, astonishes me how much the parents look up to us. So make sure that you are presenting yourself in a very professional way. Make sure that the parents understand that you and your team go above and beyond to learn new material, to keep interest in the program. You have to do things with your parents. Make sure your program includes parent involvement and make sure, please make sure that your parents are given a newsletter of some sort that tells them what's happening in your facility. I heard over and over, Miss Regina, it's COVID. We can't let people inside. I will tell you that even during the year of COVID in 2020, I got many uh, cards and letters from my parents in my facility thanking us, me and the team, because it's not just Miss Regina, thanking us for keeping them well informed when they couldn't all come inside. They felt a part of our trailblazers. I want to talk about advocacy. Advocacy is so huge in our, in our field and in our community. If you're stuck inside of your four walls, I want to challenge you to get outside because the real work is outside of your doors. It's not just inside making the kids happy. It's making sure that the community knows you're there. Make sure your, your local um, officials know that your program is worthy of maybe being joining the chambers, joining... Um, groups that um, nonprofit that help families just really get your name out there, not just for marketing, but because we care about the communities in which we serve. You cannot serve families if you don't know the community. So make sure that you're getting involved. When you're navigating this year, which I want you to have a successful 2021, remember that it starts again with you and it ends with the people that use your service. So there's three important takeaways I want you to have. The first one is don't get stuck in yesterday. Yes, yesterday might have been a horrible day. Yes, yesterday may not have fit into your dream. But I want you to know that yesterday has gone. And so it's time to look forward towards the next day. Opportunities are wrapped in dismay. And I want to stop there with that word dismay because it means that something comes unexpectedly that you didn't plan for it. But there's an opportunity for you to stand up and shine doing what we would consider a dismay. So look for opportunities in the clutter. Look for opportunities in the times where everybody else is shutting their doors and they're panicking and they're afraid. That's when you stand up with true joy. I want you to remember that you have to have a business plan. Whether or not you're trying to grow your business or stay the same or just maintain quality, you have to have a business plan because guess what? You will need one and another day's coming. Next slide, please. I want to thank you and let you know that I'm here 
if you have further, I'm going to ask her a few questions at the end of this presentation, but if you have other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Again, I want you to remember that you are the face of early childhood education. Remember that each and every time you step outside of yourself, your doors, you are a representation of not just your facility, but our industry as a whole. So I'm mindful that I'm not the only quality child care center in Wichita. I'm mindful that there are many. And so we all have to make sure that our social medias, our, our, our presentations in public, the way we present ourselves, all reflect on a professional community. You are what we call the essential glue. And the essential glue needs to stay bonded and you need to stay joy-filled. Remember that. You are the joy. I'll take some questions, Diane. I love the essential glue. I think that yeah. that is just so beautifully said. And, you know, I got to let all of the watchers and listeners know that uh, Ms. Regina just had so many fans um, from the presentation, but we'll do some, we'll do some questions because they came in, they, they, a lot of them came in. First one is, Regina, I sometimes get frustrated at the numerous situations that arise with employees being absent from work. Does this happen to you? And how do you keep your joy if it does? Absolutely, it happens to me. And if anyone tells you that they have, anyone who has a quality program ever tell you that they haven't dealt with uh, a turnover, uh, call outs, they're not being truthful. Because every now and then you get a call out. What I like to tell you to do is first of all, take a deep breath to remember that the day you will get through today. It's not fair. It feels horrible when you get that text or that call and says, I won't be making it in today. Remember to rise above that, to go in there and be the shining star of your team because the team's all going to look at you like, how are we going to get through this day? So remember that you have to be that person. I would advise you for what I do is I hire extra staff. I try and have at least two extra people on, on my team where, and I don't use them as a sub because no one wants a job where I'm only going to get called last minute if someone calls out. So that person has a 40-hour job every, every week. But they're there. If your program can uh, afford that type of a hit, I would very much advise you to put extra people on your team. Okay, I love that. Next question that we had, I have trouble leaving my center to go out and participate in the community activities and advocacy. How do you do it and what's your secret? Oh my goodness, you're gonna love this answer. I want you to find a positive poly on your team. I want you to find a young girl that's so eager to please you or older woman. I, I don't wanna make it think it has to be someone young. I want you to find a person that wants to grow. Because remember in my, my presentation, I spoke about growth for the team, not just for one person. When you find that him or her, you say to them, I'm going to step out. I'm going to actually go to a, a training this afternoon, and I need you to take care of the phones for me. Teach them how to answer your phone, how to take messages for you. Watch the empowerment, the empowerment you give that person is going to come back to you tenfold. That person is going to be so excited to show you, I can do this. And guess what you're saying to the rest of your team? You're not saying, oh, she or he is better. You're saying, I promote from within. It worked for me. I can tell you now, no one wants to stay in one position the entire years they work for you. And so it also creates a culture of if you work hard and you do right and you show yourself approved that you'll get to grow in this company. So you can leave your school. Remember that um, you have to create it like you're there all the time, even when you're not. Remember that. Remember to do things with your team. Don't allow things that you know are not uh, either ethical or, or what we call state regulated to, to happen when you're there. That way, when you go away, you feel confident that your team is still producing at a high quality. Great points. And I love that you've mentioned culture a few times. It's so mm -hmm. important to have that culture that is so positive and joyful because it really does resonate with the whole team. Sure does. I have a question from Angela. She says, I have a habit of putting others first before myself and not saying no enough. Any suggestions on how I can start saying no? And she was referring to parents, but I think that you also had some good suggestions on team members. 
Absolutely. Um, I will talk about first, I want to answer her question. So when you talk about how to say no to a parent, it's very easy. The first thing that you have to do when you say no to anyone um, is remember why you're saying no. Make sure your no is validated. Like if someone said to me, I want Johnny to not go outside every day. Well, then my question would be, is Johnny ill? Can he be in group care? Because our, I don't have staff enough to keep one teacher inside to watch Johnny alone. And if it's a tuition question or any other question, just remember this. You have to ask yourself first, why am I saying no? You don't want to say no just because it sounds good, but you want to make sure that there is a valid reason behind your no. Now, on the flip side, I want you to practice saying no, because some of us, many of us in this field, we aim to please, and sometimes we don't say no. Even when we need to say no, the answer is always yes. I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to practice. I want you to be able to say to a parent, no, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry. We can't stay 30 minutes later and wait for you to get out of your meeting. Uh, there We do have a late fee, and just practice, because once you become comfortable with why you're saying no, no will become a, a very, very easy thing to translate. I don't want to say say or get used to, but no, sometimes it, it makes you wonder um, why people continue to ask you things that are that are not either ethical or practical. It's because they've, they've learned your secret. They've learned that you won't say no. So I want you after this webinar to really, really practice saying no, because no is a good word. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. We had mentioned on the first one that children say no all the time. Absolutely. The two-year-olds are famous for it. And we get so mad at them because we get we think they're being defiant, but it's really a development thing. And they've heard someone else either say no, and they saw the response of that no. So I want you to practice that when someone comes, now, not like Diane just did, you don't want to say no before you even get the question, but you want to really ask yourself, can I do that? And if the answer is truly no, you need to look them square in the face and say, I'm sorry, but no, I, I'm very comfortable with no. <laughs> and it feels good. And, and here's the thing, the very first time you say it, you, your conscience may bother you a little bit, but I want you to look inside of yourself at that moment. Look inside of you and find out, why is this bothering me? Because it was the right thing to do, and now I'm feeling bad about it. And then once you find out your inner workings of what made you feel bad about it, you'll find that you're more comfortable saying those words, and you don't even give it a second thought. It's, it's an absolute no. <laughs> I love that. It's digging yeah. deep and, and really finding out what's inside of you. Wow, yeah. What's wrong with what's wrong with me that I feel uncomfortable when I say no? I love that. Yeah. We have another question from Carol. How do you keep toxic staff from stealing your joy and the joy of others? <laughs> Carol, I love that question. And you heard me chuckle. I, I love that question because I'm such a happy person. I'm happy by nature. I really am. And coffee. I love my coffee. But understand that you're going to have toxic people no matter where you go. And being a, the owner or, or supervisor of a program, it's really hard when that's brought into your, into your facility. I want you to, first of all, understand that you are not the reason that that person is toxic. If you could take that note down, if you don't remember anything else I say about your answer, is remember that you can't control others' re, um actions. You can only control your reaction. So they're looking for a reaction to their action. And some things you can turn your head and go, I'm not even doing that today. Or you can say to yourself, that is a hazard. So I need to talk to that person. And when it is something that needs to be addressed, don't run away from it. Hit it head on because it'll change that behavior. Remember, it's the behavior you're trying to change, not the person, because we can't change people, but we can change behavior. So understand that there are gonna be negative Nellies, I call them negative Nellies, negative Nellies and positive Polly's, and you can put them together, and you can let your positive Polly's outweigh your negative Nellies. But it starts again with you. It starts with anybody in leadership. Whatever the leader allows is what's going to happen. 
So remember, if you're the leader of a program, you have to be willing to step up and take that hard challenge and just say to that employee, I see that you're very unhappy. Is it the right place for you? Because we're a happy facility. We're here for the children and they're, they're, they're feeding off your energy and you don't need that negative energy. I can assure you again, after 40 some years in this business, that even as a teacher myself, until now owning a company, I know for a fact, no one wants to work with the negative Nelly. But if the management won't address her, people tend to join her because they think that's what you want. Mm -hmm. So true, great advice. Yeah. Angela has a question here. I sometimes feel myself getting down at the lack of appreciation from my team for all we try to do to appreciate them. For example, gifts, bonuses, support, time off, effort. How do you stay motivated when you feel unappreciated? I remember my why. And I remember answering this question the week that we did this webinar for Angela. And I think I misunderstood and thought she meant parents and she actually means teachers. Um, I remember the why. I, re I remember why I opened my company. I remember what my company's mission is. And then I just rise above. I, I try not to get into, um, wow, I gave everyone gift certificates and not anyone gave me anything. I remember that um, those people are there for the children. And if they don't feel that I need to receive anything from them, that's okay. But I do want to address the emotional part of that for you. And sometimes as a leader, you will feel lonely at the top. It is very lonely at the top. But you have to remember this. You, again, lead by example. If you want to give someone a gift, I always say this to all of my clients in my consultant business. Remember to give a gift from your heart because you shouldn't be giving it just to receive one back. And remember that the staff already think if you're the owner, you're rich, you don't need a gift. So we teach them, I say again in my answer, you have to teach people how to treat you. And one of the things I'd re much rather have than any material gift anybody could give me is a quality program where kids wanna come and they don't wanna go home. That's my gift. Aww. Oh my goodness, I just love you. <laughs> Ms. Santiago asked, any advice when parents don't follow a simple rule like picking up late all the time? Oh my goodness, I just dealt with this one so I can help you with this one. <laughs> yes, it sounds very, very um, harsh, but I want you to know that the parent that won't follow your simple policies and rules, they also won't partner with you with their child's development and growth or education. Wow. So the, the, the one thing that you need to remember is who you're dealing with. And so if it continues to be a, a, a cumbersome act, then you need to say to that parent, as much as I love taking care of your child or children, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave if you can't follow policy. And yes, that sounds extreme. And I know someone on this, on this webinar is cringing going, well, that would be half my school or I won't have any kids. But let me assure you, if you just make one example, if you just follow through with one parent, the rest of them will follow suit and they'll do what's right. Remember, people only do what you allow them to do. So if you're afraid of your own a clientele, you won't say, listen, Mrs. Jones, it's been three days of this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that you've came late. I have to stop this. If you're late tomorrow, I'm gonna have to give you notice to remove Johnny. You just have to say it because your staff, they want to go home. That's costing you labor. That's costing a morale. The person who closes is saying to all the other staff, I hate closing because Ms. Regina won't say anything to Mr. Jones, who's late every night. You don't get to hear that, but it's happening. So I really want you to know that when you step up and step out of your, uncomfort, your comfort zone and do something uncomfortable, such as a simple policy rule, you're actually saying to your team, I value you and I value our job. And I'm trying to make this a place where everybody thrives. Great advice, great advice. Get, uh, Greg, not Gary, what should a person do if they are experiencing burnout? Um, I want you to be assured of this one thing. At one time or another, all of us, including me, are gonna feel what we call a burnout. 
The burnout is actually, I want everybody to lean in close and hear Miss Regina. A burnout actually means that there's something new for you to do. And it doesn't always mean you need to leave your job. It just means you need to find a new avenue. Let's say, for instance, you are in a program that's done the same thing for the last five years and it becomes minute to you. You just go to work every day and it's the same thing. You have to bring your ideas to the top and you have to say, you know, I'm just feeling like we're stuck in 2005. Can we get to 2021? I have some ideas here. Never give problems without a solution. So if you are the uh, leader and you, you have to go to a board or you have to present your idea to someone in higher authority, you must come with a solution. It can't be, I'm so tired of the school age program and it's the same every year. You have to come with, oh, I thought about this year. Why don't we just do more walking field trips? You have to do something different. And I know I'm equating that to direct care to our families, but remember this about burnout. Burnout's really your innate spirit telling you that it's time for something different. And again, it may be that you need to sort a new job out, but if that's the case, do it with dignity and do it with, you know, with your head up and let, you know, everyone know I'm not upset with anyone here. It's just time to move on. But burnout really is your innate spirit speaking to you saying um, there's something different here. We need to do something different. And again, everyone feels that feeling at some point or another in their career. And you just have to find out what that what does that mean for you? Now, if it's physical and you're, you, you're getting so you can't perform a job or if it's mental where you get up and you drive into the parking lot and your body goes, oh, I don't want to go in there. Then, yeah, that's a true burnout. It's time to go. But if it's just that you're tired of doing the same routine, maybe talk to someone about changing up stuff. Because I want you to know as a business owner myself, sometimes we, we need new, fresh ideas. And it should be a culture where people can come and bring you those. So before you throw in the towel about burnout, remember this, Greg, that you got to find out what's causing you that feeling. Look around, maybe journal the feeling when it happens, what, what's going on. And then you can start from there and say, no, this is truly, I need to go. Oh no, I need to, to do something different. I love it. Mm -hmm. Melissa had a comment here. She said, Regina is someone I truly look up to and hope to one day be able to use her for a coach. Thank you for all the information today. Another person said, you should be a life coach too. I love the positivity you have. You are wonderful. You do co coaching, don't you? Yes, I do. In my Arm Miller Consulting, um, we actually just celebrated our third year to yesterday, the 15th, but I had a celebration today, a party. Um, we do, I do, life coaching as well. When I coach a person, it has to cross over personal and professional because believe it or not, those two things intertwine. You cannot be successful. Listen to me really carefully. I'm giving a free piece of advice here. You cannot be successful in one without the other one following. If you're unsuccessful at home, you're very successful at work, we have to make those things mirror because one can't suffer for the other. Uh, it will catch up with you. So yes, life coaching, thank you for the compliment. I really, truly appreciate that. And my clients will tell you that it's exactly what I do. I try and make sure that folks understand that it's a it's an intertwining, definitely an intertwining. I have some more compliments for you here. One webinar attendee said, this is exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you, Regina. Another one said, thank you, Regina. Wonderful and important information. Barbara said, Regina is an outstanding beloved woman and it's an honor to be a client and sister. Thanks for allowing me to join the meeting. Another person said, thank you, thank you, thank you for the great information. Ms. Helen said, this isn't a question, but a statement. Regina is a wonderful advocate for early childhood and phenomenal woman in our community. She's mm -hmm. also my mom. Thank you for all you do. And then Petrina said, I'm really enjoying this webinar. I've been doing childcare for over 22 years. I've been a director, teacher, administrator, and now a family provider. I want to be a trainer or a consultant. How do I move towards this? That's a very good question. Um, a lot of folks ask, how do I become a consultant? 
Um, I will tell you this. It, it wasn't a job that I sought out. It just kind of happened with over the 40 years of experience and, and being an um, award-winning entrepreneur. Folks would say, you know, you really ought to share your expertise. I would say to the person that feels like they have enough knowledge to do that, uh, you start very, very um, small. You, again, make a business plan, as I talked about, and then speak to someone who does that type of work. I'm not advocating that everybody needs to hire a coach. I am telling you that you need a mentor. And speaking of a mentor, I have to give props to Cindy Lindhoff, who's not on this retake, but she was one of my mentors. You need to aspire to be um, where someone you admire is already and where you feel like you want to go. And so to answer your question, I want you to start maybe by figuring out what it is that you want to coach on and, and who you want to coach. And then the second thing that I would most advise you to do, especially me being a business coach, would be to, to get your, your business LLC'd. Make it a, a reputable business because you'll hear so many people calling themselves a coach or um, claiming to be a life coach, but there's no no substance there. There's no 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 proof that they've been through the that that trenches. So make sure that the person that's talking to you or coaching you is somebody that you know have firsthand touched some of the things that they're talking about. Um, again. I applaud you for wanting to do this job, but you really, really, it, it's a lot of work and it, it, it just doesn't come with, I'll talk to someone and then they'll go off and be successful. You have to actually hold hands and see them cross over. So coaching is not just about, um, I'm going to talk to you and then tomorrow you're going to go be successful. It is that one-on-one -on -one of making sure that when you put your name out there or your business name out there, that you're going to see it to completion. So good luck with that. And again, I would love to help in any way I can. If I can answer any questions for you, I'd be happy to do that. But remember that you need to find a mentor and a coach yourself first before you're coaching. And Regina, what's your website? I'm going to put, try to put this slide up, this last slide, just so everybody... Sure. It is um, www.rmillerconsultingllc.com. Again, it's all one word, www.rmillerconsultingllc.com. And I'm emphasizing LLC because I used to have another website and we just redesigned it and we stuck in the LLC behind it. So if you was to just Google R. Miller Consulting, it won't come up. But if you do R. Miller Consulting LLC.com, it will come up. Oh, I love that. Last comment we have here is thank you, Regina. Your words are wonderful. And I just want to echo from the National Child Care Association. You had mentioned Cindy Lindhoff, and she's the director of the association. And when she introduced you, she said it was a mutual mentorship. And I thought that that was just so beautiful because it's all about supporting one another. <laughs> And for you to take so much time on this presentation, not once, but twice, we are just so, so thankful for you, Regina. And we hope that everyone shared in the experience that I have and that the attendees did and that this gets out to more and more people because your words mm -hmm. really are joyful and you bring so much light and energy in such a positive way to an industry that can be challenging. And we thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to do it twice. I just want to again re reiterate that we bring the joy. So guess what? Let's bring the joy every day because every day won't be a good day. But if you feel it in here, I tell you folks ask me all the time, why are you always so happy? I'm happy because of what's inside of me. There, I, I just always ask God, let me live to 90 something because I got a lot more I want to give and I want to ensure that the folks coming behind me feel that joy as well. So every day won't be a good day, but the joy inside of you should carry you through. Thank you, Regina. And I'm going to stop this, but let's stay together. Thanks, everyone.